Jesus calls us the light of the world. And he says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And he's referring to us as followers of Jesus Christ. And he's referring to us as a church, that we are a city on a hill. And I'm excited for what we have this morning. Uh, some of you know that we are connected to what's called the Venture Church Network. Uh, and we are part of a region called the Rocky Mountain Church Network. Uh, and John Kraft is the executive director. John, come on up here. John's going to bring the word to us this morning. Uh, and I'm very grateful for my partnership and friendship with John. And for us as a church, as we continue to deepen our partnership with the Rocky Mountain Church Network going forward. Longmont Calvary has an extraordinary history that we get to build upon as we plan and prepare for the future. And I really honestly believe that our secret sauce of success in advancing the kingdom of God will be our partnerships with other organizations and other people. It's not just going to be us on our own. And so I'm very grateful that as a church, we're part of the Venture Church Network uh, and with John individually. Uh, John has been a pastor for 30 years in five different places. Yeah, or more so. or less. More or less. So he kind of knows what he's doing. <laughs> Maybe. As pastors, you know, I'll let him, he can throw himself under the bus if he wants to, it's fine. But I'm very grateful for John. He knows what he's doing. He's an experienced mm -hmm. pastor and now overseeing kind of our region, uh, which includes churches here in Colorado, I think Kansas, yeah, Kansas, one church. Utah, and yeah. Wyoming. And Montana. And Montana. Yeah. So a lot and of we're responsibility. we're trying to get Hawaii, oh. but that's not going well for us yet. The Rocky Mountain Church Network <laughs> extends to Hawaii. <laughs> Anyone here want a church plant there? <laughs> Sign you up today. You might, you, I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> oh, Garrett, thank you so much. Uh, church, thanks for being here this morning. It is so awesome uh, to be a part, to be a part of the worship, to worship in English and Spanish, and to uh, be together with you. Uh, my name, I am John. I'm the executive director of Rocky Mountain Church Network. We are thankful for our partnership uh, with Calvary Church in Longmont, and thankful for you as a church and your long history of ministry here in Longmont. I, I think uh, close to 70 years of ministry here in the city. But as I think about where you are as a church and where we are as a network, I'm convinced that more and more we need to keep looking forward to what God has for us. Uh, when you get in your car and you drive out of the parking lot in just a few moments, uh, you're going to look and you're going to see your rear view mirror and your windshield. There's a reason that your rear view mirror is this big and your windshield is this big. It's awesome to be connected to the past. We need to see what's happened behind us, but that's not what we're going. That's not where we're going. We are headed into the future. And as we move into the future, I know, I am convinced, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has great things in store for you as a church and for us as a region, and particularly as we work together. Now, I do have to correct one thing that Pastor Garrett said, which is... I have been a pastor for a long time, but that does not necessarily equate to me knowing what I'm doing. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. So, uh, but uh, that's, we're not here to talk about this. We're here to open the word together. We're going to be in two passages this morning. You can open to Matthew chapter 28. Uh, stick your finger in there. Stick a piece of paper in there. Uh, stick your neighbor's finger. Stick, stick something in there. We're not going to start in Matthew 28. We're actually going to start in Matthew chapter 16. As we look at two iconic, important, monumental passages having to do with who we are as a church and what we are to be doing. So uh, Matthew 28, we'll get to. Matthew tw uh, chapter 16 is where we will start. So I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to pray for us, and then we will get right to work in Matthew chapter Matthew chapter uh, 16. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, so much for the worship this morning. As your people gather together, lift their voices up uh, to you, praising you as the God who does new things, as the God who does new works, as the God who, as we see at the end of the book, says, behold, I am making all things new. And we recognize that you do that in each and every one of us as individuals when we place our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But then you desire to do that in, the, in our midst as a church and in our community as we serve it as your people. And so, Father, I pray that as we spend some time now in your word, that you'd give us a clearer picture of what that looks like. 
and that you take me the, this morning as, as the speaker, as the preacher, the, uh, the primary communicator of your word to your people, that you would take me and fill me with your spirit, uh, God, this morning. Uh, empower me to speak to your people words that are not just a nice uh, collection of thoughts or a good way to spend a few moments together, but words that are important and meaningful and transformational. So that the end result of being your people spending time together in your church looking at your word is that we would look a little more like you and follow you more closely. Uh, Father, thank you for this time. Be honored in it. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a little odd, but I have... uh, confession to make to you this morning. It's odd because, I mean, I show up like the first time, you know, the new regional director come to your church and I'm like, oh, I have a confession to make. The confession is, uh, I, I love the church. I love the church of Jesus Christ. I am committed to the local church. I love the church. Lori and I, in our role, uh, we travel across our region. We are typically in a different church every week. Uh, last week we were in Wyoming. The week before that, I for, even forget where we were. Next week we'll be south side of Denver. We're going to be in Utah. We're going to be in Wyoming. We'll be in Montana. And all of these churches are in different locations and they look different. Uh, we go to our church in Ogden, Utah, Washington Heights Baptist Church. Amazing church just north of Salt Lake City. 1,900 people show up every weekend to worship God together. It's amazing to be there. Uh, We'll go down to Los Los Animas, uh, Colorado, to Hooper, Colorado. Has anyone heard of Hooper, Colorado? If you've not heard of Hooper, don't worry, because people who live in Hooper have never heard of Hooper. It's a small little town. Show up there, 20 people, and we love each and every time with God's people. As God's people gather together to worship, to learn, and to be empowered to go out and fulfill the Great Commission, there is nothing better than being a part of that. I love the local church. I love the local church because it is God's chosen instrument to bring him glory. I love the local church because it is God's chosen instrument to further his kingdom. It is his chosen instrument to give people hope through changing lives and changing eternities. And so, I love the local church. And I love the local church because I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. Some of you, you see that statement and you have the exact same knee-jerk reaction that I had. Which is, no it's not. Jesus is the hope of the world. And yes, that's absolutely true. But, how is the world going to know about Jesus unless there are healthy, functioning, active local churches. God has chosen the local church to reach the world for his glory's sake. So I love the local church, and we are called to provide hope, to bring people to the hope that's available through Jesus. But sometimes the church struggles to do that. And I think the church struggles to do that for two reasons. The first reason is that sometimes we just forget what we're supposed to be doing. As a church, it's easy to forget that. It's easy to get distracted from what God calls us to do. It's easy for us to think that that being the church is just about this. It's about coming and hanging out together and singing songs we like. Or maybe we don't like, but we'll put up with that. Listen to a guy go on for about half an hour and then go to lunch. And that's what we're supposed to do as a church. Or we get distracted. We get distracted by things that we see on TV. We get distracted by things that we read on the internet. We get distracted from what God calls us to do. And when that happens, we stop being the hope of the world. Secondly, I think sometimes the church struggles because the fact of the matter is we're falling behind. Uh, There's a a group, it's called Lifeway Publishing. Uh, It's the publishing arm of the Southern Baptists. Uh, You probably have done studies through Lifeway and maybe not even known about it. Uh, Lifeway has done a study every year uh, looking at the number of churches that open versus the number of churches that close. And for a long time, there were more churches that opened than churches that closed. 
you know, that there'd be more churches planted than churches that would close. So you would have a net gain in churches. The problem was, even when that was true, the church was falling behind. We were not keeping up with population growth. So the population of the United States was growing faster than we were planting churches to be able to reach them. That changed in 2019, which is the latest data that they have. They just released this uh, earlier this spring. 2019, for the first time in the history of this study, more churches closed than opened. 2019, 3,000 estimated, 3,000 churches planted, 4,500 churches closed. So 50% more. We weren't keeping up before, and now we're seeing an actual net decline, and that was pre-COVID. I am convinced that what we need to be about as Rocky Mountain Church Network, as Venture Church Network, and as Calvary Longmont is to be a part of being used by God to plant new churches to see new works, because that is one of the greatest ways that we have to reach the world for Jesus. You'll see, uh, Ed Stetzer uh, writes that in the first two years of a church's existence, they will see almost twice as many people come to Christ as they will after 15 years of existence. That the longer a church is in existence, just Naturally, we become comfortable. Naturally, we begin to think it's about us. Naturally, we quit moving forward. Which is why as uh, Venture Church Network, we have adopted a new mission statement, which is that we are helping, we are helping churches take bold steps. We're helping churches take bold steps because it's going to take a bold step to start something new. But here's the great thing is we follow the God who does bold things. We follow the God who empowers us to do bold things. And we, we follow the God who has promised to be with us as we do bold things. And so what we want to do this morning is we think about taking a bold step of following Jesus in his mission and following Jesus in his heart for his church. We're going to look at two passages that are going to help us see what his priorities are for us and for our work in the world. And my hope and my prayer is that you will see that if you're here this morning and you are a Christian, Jesus' priorities for his church should be your priorities for his church. So Matthew chapter 16, a really incredible passage. Matthew chapter 16, uh, what's going on here is kind of in the middle of Jesus' ministry. They've hit some opposition. Jesus and his disciples, they, they kind of retire. They, they, go, they go away. Uh, they retreat a little bit uh, outside of the border of Israel. They're north of Israel in a region called Caesarea Philippi. It's a Gentile area. They go up there uh, and Jesus is uh, asking them some questions. So here we are, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, 13. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. Let me stop right here, and I'll give you the John Craft paraphrase of this, of this verse right here. So Jesus has said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my Father is in heaven. John Crabb paraphrase of this is that Jesus has this big excl exclamation and says, Holy cow, Peter! God must have told you that because you're not smart enough to figure that out on your own. That's what's going on right there when Jesus says, Blessed are you, my Father's revealed this to you. Flesh and blood hasn't. But then 
Jesus gives one of the most important promises in the New Testament. I will build, he says, I tell you, you're Peter and on this rock, so you're Peter on your statement that you've made of who I am, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let's look at this promise that takes place here because it, it, it has a huge bearing on what we do as a church. Uh, we look and we see that Jesus says, I will, I will. So Jesus here, Jesus promises to build his church. In uh, chapter 16, verse 18, the end of that, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So what I see in this passage is as we look at this, whenever you think of the church, whether it's here, Calvary, Longmont, the church that Lori and I attend in Johnstown, the church in Ogden, Utah, wherever you are, it's not our church. Do you notice, as Jesus says this, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus gets really possessive of the church. He does not say, I will build a church. He does not say, I will build the church. What does he say? I will build my church. Church does not belong to us. This is not your church. This is Jesus' church. It belongs to him. It's his idea. He started it. He died for it. He, he created it. He empowers it. He sends it. It's his church. And since it's his church, then we need to pay attention to what he says about it. We need to pay attention to what he says we should be. What he says we should do. What, what he says we should hope for. And what he says we should focus on. We pay attention to what Jesus has to say because this is his church, not ours. We cannot think that the church is about us, what we like, what makes us feel comfortable. It's a place for us to hang out together and avoid the chaos of the world for an hour. We cannot think that this is simply about us. It's his church. It's his idea. He created it because he died for it. But then Jesus says that the church will be built even when it doesn't seem possible. Two things that we see in this passage. First, uh, Jesus asks the disciples, who do men say that I am? And as uh, Jesus says, as, as uh, the disciples respond, as they answer it, they say, well, some say uh, you are Elijah. Elijah. Uh, you know, one of the prophets who was supposed to come before the Messiah. So you're like the predecessor to the Messiah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say, uh, some say you're John the Baptist. That doesn't make sense to us because you guys are in the same room together. I, we don't get that one. But people are confused about that, you know. So Jesus says, I will build my church even when people are confused or have a misunderstanding of who I am just like today, right? You ask people who is Jesus, you'll get a wide range of answer. We live in the midst of confusion, even about who Jesus is. You, people think uh, he was a good teacher. He was a great guy. He was a good moral example. He was the example of someone who loved other people, even, even when it cost him. All of those things are true, but they fall short of who Jesus actually is. The eternal, self-existent, creator God of the universe. Feels like God can't do anything if people don't understand who Jesus is. People were confused here and Jesus saying what? I will build my church. Uh, secondly, it seems like at this point, uh, the mission has maybe gone off the rails a little bit. Uh, you back up to Matthew chapter 12, and that's where you see the scribes and the Pharisees begin to plot against Jesus. Like, they're trying to figure out, how are we going to kill this dude? How are we going to get rid of this guy? And so Jesus and the disciples, they withdraw. They go to Caesarea Philippi because it, it feels like the mission is in danger. So Jesus says, I will build the church in the midst of confusion, confusion about who he is, but I also will build my church in the midst of rejection. 
And so it feels like sometimes you talk to people or you look at the culture and they're like, yeah, we don't want anything to do with it. Jesus will still build his church because he is the all-powerful one. And then we have this iconic, important, crucial moment where Peter declares the foundational truth that Jesus is the Christ. He is the one Israel had been waiting for. He is the son of the living God, the one who died for us, the one who cares about his church. And Jesus says, I say, you're Peter, but upon this statement, the statement of who I am, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Which makes me stop and ask the question, what is the deal? What is the deal with the gates? What is this about the gates? What is Jesus actually saying here? Because Jesus says, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. I'm afraid that for a long, long time we've gotten this verse wrong. I know I did. Here's what my picture of this verse was. The church gets together. And we come inside the building. And we sing some songs. And we're together. And we like support and encourage each other. We pray for each other. Those are all really good things. But we come in here and we do that. And then the gates of hell attack us and they attack and they attack and they attack and they can't do anything because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and so we sing songs like we are safe and secure from all alarm uh, though satan should buffet right so we're in here the gates of hell are attacking us and the gates of hell will not prevail against us if that's what you think about this verse you need to think something different <laughs> because that's not what Jesus is saying here. And I believe that for one crucial, simple reason. You do not attack with a gate. Gates are totally a defensive structure, right? You have never been going down the street and you're like, oh no, that dude's got a gate. Like you've never thought that. <laughs> Gates are purely defensive. Gate has two purposes. To keep something in. If you have a dog, you came to church and you left your gate open, that dog is now running through Longmont. Because the gate is designed to keep something in. Or a gate is designed to keep something out to protect your family, to protect your house, to keep people out of your yard, to keep them from trampling through your flowers, whatever. A gate keeps something out or it keeps something in. The gates of hell are designed to keep people from knowing about Jesus. You don't attack with a gate. So this is not a picture of the gate coming against the church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. This is a picture of the church moving forward, pressing against the gates of hell. And as the church takes bold steps and moves forward, the gates of hell cannot stand against it. Because the gates of hell cannot stand up against the almighty, all-powerful God. And the people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit, the gates of hell cannot stand against a church that is moving forward in what God wants it to do. And so we look to see how we as a church can take bold steps, how we as a church can move forward. And I am convinced that starting new churches is an incredible way to do that. Because then we have our church that's pushing against the gates of hell. And then we've got a new church. Then they're pushing against the gates of hell. And we're seeing God's kingdom further and further and expand and expand and lives and eternities changed. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. How do we do that? How, how do we keep moving forward? We keep moving forward. We keep moving forward as we remember the mission. What is the point of the church? What is our purpose? Over now, 
Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28, as we see the mission, the mission of the church. Matthew chapter 28, uh, Jesus has gone to the cross. He has, uh, he's died to pay the penalty for sin. He's been put in the ground. He's raised from the dead. Uh, he spent some time on the earth. He's uh, encountered his disciples several times up to this point. Uh, he's shown up in the locked room. There's that whole uh, thing with uh, doubting Thomas. That's taken place before this. And so now we're here uh, on a mountain that Jesus has called his disciples too. And he says to them, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age, to the end of the age. Here we see the Great Commission. It is Jesus giving us the mission that we are to fulfill. And simply put, the mission of the church is to make disciples. And I would love it if we could all go like, oh, amen, and we close in prayer and we go to lunch. The problem is we have a misunderstanding of what it means to make disciples. And when we have that misunderstanding... Nothing good comes of it. This is First Baptist Church, Tucson, Arizona. I grew up in Arizona. I'm an Arizona kid. I was born in Tucson. Uh, elementary school in Phoenix, high school in Tucson, college in Phoenix. I uh, grew up in Arizona. Arizona kid. First Baptist Church, Tucson, Arizona. Iconic, iconic church within Conservative Baptist or Venture Church Network uh, movement. I uh, had a pastor at this church. He was pastor here for like 54 years. His name was R.S. Beale. You read A History of Conservative Baptist, which by the way is one of the most boring books you could ever read. <laughs> you read that history book, R.S. Beale's name all through it. Really instrumental in, in leading our movement in, in, uh, in fidelity to scripture and commitment to following Jesus. Really incredible guy. Lived a long, long, he lived so long. There literally were like the R.S. Beale Memorial Center, R.S. Beale Memorial Library. And he was still alive. That's how long he lived. When R.S. Beale was pastor of this church, they'd be 1,500 on a Sunday morning. One of the first mega churches in the Tucson area. This church, uh, it means everything to me. When I was in uh, junior high, horrific abuse in my family, incredible dysfunction. First Baptist Church came alongside of me as, as a young man. Helped me through that. My youth pastor spent hours with me. I, I was at this church every opportunity I could go. Sunday morning, Sunday night, youth group, activities, camps. This church is a huge reason I am who I am today. It's conversations with my youth pastor that led me to go into ministry, that, le that led me to this point today. First Baptist Church, Tucson, Arizona, closed in, 20, in 2002. They forgot what God called them to do. They got a skewed view of what it means to make disciples that it's just about learning stuff and, and huddling together. And at the end, there were eight people sitting in a thousand-seat auditorium trying to figure out what their next step was. Now, there's a fabulous church that meets in this building now. It's still used for kingdom's sake, and, and they're doing incredible things. They're doing what my church forgot to do. Forgot that they we're supposed to be reaching the next generation. This church is like four blocks from the University of Arizona. And now there's a church that's reaching college students in an incredible way. Uh, this church is in the midst of a neighborhood that's getting browner and browner and browner. 
The First Baptists forgot that, forgot that they're called to reach the people that God entrusts to them. And because of it, it's closed. See, when Jesus says, I will build my church, he's talking about the big C church. He's not talking about any specific local church. Which means that you and I, as followers of Jesus, who are committed to the big C church, we've got to be a part of moving forward together in the mission of the church. Because if a church will do that, we will see incredible things take place as we are obedient to the Great Commission charge to make disciples. And simply put, a disciple is a follower of Jesus. For, for a lot of people, we think of discipleship as uh, learning information, that I knew this much about Jesus here, and I know more about Jesus now, so I am further along the discipleship journey. That's uh, only part of it. See, in the Great Commission, Jesus says, Go therefore into all nations and make disciples of all, or go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. You see three aspects to discipleship there. First, baptizing them means you see people who are coming to Jesus. As a church, we need to be reaching out, communicating the gospel in a way that communicates God's love and God's salvation so that people respond to the message and they come to Jesus. That's step one of the discipleship journey. Then we teach them. They learn about Jesus. Too often we stop here. But Jesus says, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. So we see someone come to Jesus, we see someone learn about Jesus, and then we see someone look like Jesus. And as people look more and more like Jesus, they're disciples following him. And so as we think about the mission of the church, God's call to make disciples you have to remember that you are a part of that. And you are a part of making disciples. You're a part of the Great Commission because Jesus, like over and over and over, uses all-encompassing words. Uh, here are the all, like, all-inclusive words in the Great Commission. He says, he says, all authority has been given to me, all nations Go, therefore, make disciples in all nations, uh, teaching them to reserve all that I've commanded you. And then Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's not the end of the age yet. I'm pretty sure about that because we're all here. If it's not the end of the age, then we're still fulfilling God's commission. You and I, part of the great commission charge to make disciples. And as a church... As a network of churches, this has got to be our focus. It has got to be our focus. There's a, an important little commentary that Matthew makes leading into the Great Commission. A lot of times pastors or missionaries are so excited to get to the Great Commission, we skip this part. Back up two verses, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 says, now the 11 disciples, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Before we move on, I just want to point out, these are the 11 disciples. Judas betrayed Jesus, he went and he hung himself. So we have 11 disciples left. Those are the people who are here. Some commentators try to add other people. There's no indication anyone other than the 11 disciples are here. Because Jesus says, the 11, or Matthew says, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus directed them. And when they saw him, verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Have you ever noticed that? Some doubted. How could they doubt? These are the 11 disciples. Walk with Jesus three years. They, they know he's killed. He's put in the tomb. He's risen from the dead. And before this, he's shown up several times. He invites Thomas to touch him. He says, touch the, touch the wounds in my hand. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Jesus even made these guys breakfast. <laughs> 
In one of the greatest acts of love, in my opinion, he cooks them fish. (laughs) But some doubt. But even beyond that, Jesus is standing right there. They see him. But some doubt. How can that be? It helps us understand this if we understand the word that Matthew uses for doubt right here. It does not convey unbelief or disbelief. Uh, The word that's used here literally means two stances. They have two options. They're wrestling with what their next step is. They're looking at the guy they had followed for three years who had died. They knew he was dead. He was put in the tomb. They knew where the tomb was. Then he rose again. And they're faced with, what does this mean for me now? What is my next step? If he can do that, what does it mean for me? Because if he did that, my life can no longer be the same. And the same thing's true for you and me in the room today. If Jesus rose from the dead, which, side note, he did, then our life cannot be the same. Our priorities cannot be the same. Our purpose cannot be the same. The way we treat people cannot be the same. The things we hope for, the things we pray for, the things we want to see happen in our church, none of those can be the same. But it's so easy to get distracted between the two stances that we lose sight of the mission. Jesus is calling us to follow him Jesus is calling us to fulfill his mission. Jesus is calling us to stop standing in two stances and to wholeheartedly be a part of fulfilling his mission for the church. In fact, what Jesus is calling us to do is to be a part of his work. The church today needs far more co-laborers and far fewer customers. The church needs far more people who are digging in and being a part of the mission of what God calls us to do and far fewer people who simply show up and take in and consume. Because, is this our church? No, it belongs to him. It's his church. So we should be co-laborers with him. And as we wrap up, I am excited to see Rocky Mountain Church Network take step after step after step towards planting churches. We have not planted a church in a long time. In fact, I think the last church that we actively participated uh, helping a church plant was the church plant that came from Calvary over in Longmont with Warren Johnson. That was a long time ago. We need to start new things. And we're excited to be a part of that journey. Because what we see in the Great Commission and what we see in the rest of the New Testament is that it is a story of church planting. Because Jesus told the disciples to make, uh, Jesus told the 11 disciples to make disciples. They left and they planted churches. Every single one of them. Jesus says, make disciples. What do they do? They plant churches. Thomas goes all the way to India, plants churches. Mark goes to Egypt, plants churches. I've had the incredible privilege of worshiping in a little chapel that's outside of Cairo that dates back. It's been actively used for worship since Mark was in Egypt, planting churches. So Jesus says make disciples. The disciples, they plant churches. Second, all the churches in the New Testament, they were church plants. Every book that you read, that's written to a church plan. Now, that's because it was all starting. It was all new, but God is in the business of doing his work through new things. And so all the churches in the New Testament were church plans. In fact, when you see Paul go on his missionary journey, you, all of Paul's missionary journeys were church planning journeys. He wasn't just going and, you know, saying, hey, I'm here, I'm a missionary. No, he went and he started churches. And beyond that, Paul went 
commissioned by a local church to go plant churches, just like happened here in Calvary Longmont to plant a church in Firestone. You see that in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, uh, the church in Antioch, really the key, uh, a really important church in, in the history of the church, church in Antioch. It's where uh, believers were called Christians for the first time. It says in Acts chapter 13, verse 3, that after fasting and praying, they, the leadership, the elders of the church in Antioch, laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them off. And where did they go from there? They went to plant churches. Then lastly, and unfortunately, what was normal in the New Testament has become out of the norm today. And as a network, a region of churches, partnering with local churches, we want to bring this back in and be a part of seeing God do new things in our churches, in our communities, as God's people come together and through the power of the Holy Spirit, start new things so that we can see God's kingdom further and expand. Because Jesus said, there are some gates that need storming. And so as a church, Calvary Church, the church, our region of churches, the church, the big C church around the world, let's be people who are committed to honoring God through fulfilling his mission of making disciples, partly through what takes place here and partly through what takes place out there. And as we do that, the gates of hell cannot stand against us. Let's stand together as uh, we wrap our time up this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his call on our life, bringing us into a relationship with you through his death, burial, and resurrection as we place our faith in that. God, we recognize that you do all sorts of incredible new things in us. But then, Father, you desire to use us to, to do even greater things. And, and as you do those greater things in us and through us, our hope and our prayer, our desire is that you are lifted up, you are magnified, that as more people come to Christ, that there are more people who are praising you. Because God, you deserve all of our praise, all of our glory, all of our love, all of our devotion. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.